So the one who is the King of Kings, the one who reigns forevermore, the one who is seated in power, who is seated in might, who is seated in majesty. All over the room, just lift up your voices. Even as you close your eyes and you exalt the name of Jesus, tell him, Lord, you are worthy to receive the glory and honor and adoration. You are worthy, Jesus. You are worthy. Just with your eyes closed, with your hands lifted. Can your worship rise to him this very moment? The Bible says in Isaiah 6, as I was writing, he saw the seraphs. They were flying around about the throne and they were saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The heaven and the earth is filled with his glory. That is the one we have come to exalt. That is the one we have come to worship. Lift up your voices and exalt his name. Exalt his name from the depths of your heart. Worship him in your own words. In your own words. Can we take that song again?
Say glorious God. You are. claim Lord You 
to exalt the one who is Yahweh, the one who is Alpha and Omega, the one who reigns above all things, the one who is glorious beyond description. There's no better way than to worship him in the spirit. You can lift up your voice right now. If you are lost for words, you can pray in the Holy Ghost. Anombra hasi celebrian to kapananwa deste velara vele keni anda vesere vedia de kel vetine komanando feria se falanga tia te felakaria doste banana mama kel Jesus we exalt you we give you the highest of reverence we say be thou exalted above every other name we say be thou exalted above every other name we cast the crowns before you we lay it at your feet and we say holy 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 is the lord god almighty oh jesus we declare you lord of all we declare you king of glory can we lift up our voice and say you are
You are the name above all names. At the mention of your name, every knee shall bow. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of the Father. From the rising of the sun and unto the going down of the same. The name of the Lord shall be glorified. The name of the Lord shall be exalted. The name of the Lord shall be praised. And this morning we cast down our crowns and our medals, our titles and our epaulets, all that we are and all that we have. We lay them at your feet, O oh God. In sign of surrender, we worship you in the beauty of holiness. Receive our praise, receive our worship. Be exalted in your sanctuary this morning and father this morning we yield to you and we ask that your spirit will lead and guide us measure another thousand cubits this morning and take us deeper you know so I think two weeks after the first my first rapture we were still in the sanctuary in the evening worship time when I was taken up now, we were standing, praying, and then I would drop like a bag. Boom. The moment I dropped, she, she, she would just know it's gone. So the second time we were, we were standing, and in fact, we were not in the, at the altar, we were at our seat, we were standing and praying, and then I dropped. Now, the first time when I was taken up, there was an angel, there was a staircase, you remember, and then there was a gate. That was closed when the angel drew near the gate. The gate opened by itself. The angel entered. I entered and the gate closed behind us. The second time when, when I was raptured, there was no angel. There was no staircase. When I was taken up, I found myself in front of a gate. The gate, the gate was half open. And I was standing outside. Now the first time we went, I came in through the west gate. You know, we came through the west gate. We we're going this way. The second time I went, we, I came through the south gate, coming this way, and I was standing outside, and the Lord Jesus was standing inside, like 10, 15 meters away from where I was. And I was standing outside. I didn't know if I should go in or I should wait for a command. So I was standing, kind of trembling, you know, like reverential presence. And then he was wearing a long, sparkling white robe with a blue scarf on his chest like this. And then he turned, he was, I was seeing his back. He 
was giving me his back and then I waited for a while and then he turned with a smile that I cannot describe. Oh, my brothers, Jesus is smile. If you see Jesus and he only smiles to you, your life will change forever. I'm telling you, something about the smile on his face that will make you drunk with love for him. He turned and with a broad smile, I mean, his face was all lighted. And he says, Nyango, I've been waiting for you. Come, let's go. And like a little boy, I ran to meet up with him. On this street, this, now, this is another side of the city. This is not the first city that I saw when I came in the first time. This is a completely different city. And the, the mansions on this side are more sumptuous than the first ones I saw. On this street paved with gold, I, I, I ran to him. When I met, I caught up with him. We started walking. And, you know, as we were walking, he didn't say any word. We just we moved on a certain distance. On, by the, on the road, you know, like in Lagos here or like in Cameroon, you see stones, precious stones of different kind and different colors on the street. I couldn't remove my eyes from I was seeing the stones with the corner of my eye, but my whole attention was stayed on him. Like I couldn't take off my eyes from him to look to look around. This time around, I'm not looking around. I'm, my, my whole focus is him. So we walked on a certain distance and on our right side, some people were naturally angels, were concluding their, they were like uh, masons, bricklayers. They were finishing their, their work of the day. So we stopped by them and Jesus said, I want you to take a look at what these men, are, these gentlemen are doing. And they were turning the mortar. You know how we do mortar here when we are constructing? We do cement and sand and gravel or whatever. And he said, look at what they're doing. And I looked and I said, they are, turned, they are, they are preparing the mortar. He said, look at the material they are using in preparing the mortar. And the material was pure gold. He said, see the material I am using to construct the houses in which you, the elect, are going to live when you come here. Pure gold. And he said, why is it that you, my servants, you have given the impression to the world that I am so unable to finance my work. Somebody asked a question on finance yesterday. So unable to finance my work that you are forced to resort to all kinds of techniques and gimmicks to take money from people on the guise that I sent you to do some work and I did not give you the resources. And I said to him, Lord, you have done well to have mentioned this issue of money. Because this money issue is one of the issues that was burning my lips. I really wanted us to. He said, I knew you had the question. That's why I brought you back the second time. And I said, I would really be happy if you would tell me everything about money in the house of God. Because the truth is sometimes we are genuine. We really want to serve God. It's not like we are greedy. It's not like we're trying to make money for ourselves. We really want to advance the kingdom of God. And the resources are not there. He said, that's why I brought you back. He says, sometimes if... Jesus is now talking to me. Sometimes I want to open the heaven like this and shout to creation and say, don't listen to them. I didn't send them. I said, no, Lord, you are hard on us. I mean, talking about us, the pastor. He said, sometimes he wants to open the heaven and say to creation, don't listen to them. I didn't send them. I tell him, Lord, you are hard on us. The truth, the re my, my, rea my reality then is that, see, before I went to heaven, I wasn't a, I wasn't a thief. I've never stolen money from anybody. God knows. Even though I wasn't in this alignment, the current alignment, I was doing ministry with a genuine heart. I wasn't looking for, I never dupe anybody. I never charged to go and preach anywhere. When I go preaching, they give, whatever they give me is okay. If they give me anything, I receive with joy. If they don't give me anything, I don't demand for anything. Because my privilege is to serve him. So I said, Lord, you are being hard on us. 
So he said, imagine that today you went back to Yaounde. Now, I, when I was raptured, I'm in the United States, you remember? He said, if you went back to Yaounde, the capital, I mean, Yaounde is the capital city of Cameroon, right? If you went back to Yaounde today, and you met the ordinary Cameroonian on the street, and you told him that you are coming from the Unity Palace. Unity Palace is our presidency. You're coming from the Unity Palace, and you met with President Paul Bia. I said, oh, so you know Paul Bia until you're calling his name. You met with the president and, and he sent you with a letter to go and give it to the governor in Douala. But he didn't give you transport, transport fare, and you had to go around begging or, you know, trying to borrow from people to go and run an errand up for the president. How, how would they react? I said, oh, the Cameroonian will tell you, my friend, get out of here, go and tell it to some people in the far, in the bush somewhere. You saw the where did you see the president? Or he gave you an errand to go and and run for him, and he didn't dash you a car. He said, that's, that's what the Cameroonian would think, right? I said, yes. He said, but you say, I sent you, I, the God of the universe, to go run an errand for me, that the ministry you are doing, the work you are doing, is me that commissioned you, and I didn't give you the resources to go and do it. So you have to develop, like you see in the church, we have developed all kinds of techniques. We sell water, we sell oil, we sell everything. We sell prayers and prophecies in the name of we are raising money to do the work of God. He said, it's an insult to me. And I said, yes, but I understand that. Just that the reality on the earth is not the same. He says, I brought you here so I can show you where the problem is. And while I was standing with him, I saw myself sitting in my office in Cameroon. He said, is that not you in your office? I said, yes. Now, every October, every first week of October, we have our annual conference. And you are all invited to come and visit us this year. Hey, mama. And this year is going to be very special because we're going to dedicate our, our temple by the grace of God. Amen. So every first week of, of, of October, we celebrate our church anniversary and we do our an annual conference. So this is me sitting in my office and I'm drafting the budget of the convention or the conference. Okay, this year we're going to have the conference from this day to this day. We are inviting so and so and so and so men of God and we have to buy their air ticket. It's going to cost us this. We'll lodge them in this hotel. It's going to cost this. We're going to do publicity, all the adverts. It's going to, you know how we do the budget, right? We do all the expenditures and we say the budget, if we will do all this, it's going to cost us 40 million or 50 million or whatever. Now, the second page is, where will the money come from? Now, you turn the new page and say, the money is going to come from general offering. People are going to give offering every day, offering time, blessing time, right? We're going to get offering. Last year, when we did the conference, the offering gave us approximately uh, this amount of money. This year, if God takes us from glory to glory, we anticipate our partners, our friends across the world, when they hear we have annual conference, some people will call from wherever not and send their support, whatever. So, the offering of partners and so on is going to give us this. And then what again? During the conference, the conference we're going to sell gadgets, t-shirts, whatever not, souvenirs that people... You know, all of that is a means of raising money so we can foot our bills. And then we'll do what again? Then we make the list of all the possibilities. You know, then, not now. Then we will sell CDs, all the CDs of the conference. Da, 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 da. Then we make the list. And then we say, if we observe this, if things work the way we are planning them, we, our, the expenditure is 50 million. And if, we, if this plan that we are putting up is, is we execute it well, we may end up having 60 million. So we we'll, we'll spend 50. When the conference is finished, we must have a balance sheet of 10 million in our account. The 10 million is usually during the conference, one guitar will get broken or some, some sound system will get spoiled. You know, we use the balance to repair, you know, and then keep some money in the, in the coffer so that next year when we are starting the preparations of the conference, we don't start from scratch. It looks like a plan, right? And now, when we are finished setting up, drafting the budget, expenditures and income. Now we bring it to God. We say, Lord, our budget this year is 50 million. Lord, we command the money to come from the north, the south, the east, to west. We start doing all the prayer. 
Uh, money, come now. We command money. Lord, make the brothers to be generous. Let them. And Jesus said, that's exactly where the problem is. Has anybody seen the problem in what I've just described? Huh? Who has seen the problem? Okay. What is the problem? Okay. He says the problem is that I've already drafted my plan before I came to God. Uh -huh. Somebody else. Oh. She said I left Jesus out of the plan. Yes, mama. Yes, with the glasses. Okay. Thank you. Yes. I made a plan. The one who sent me, I never went back to him to ask for the resources. But when we are now bringing the plan and saying, Lord, give us, provide, in my understanding, we are going back to him because he gave us a brain to think, right? No? Okay, somebody else wanted to talk. Yes. Ah, I'm sure you have watched this video before. <laughs> you know, Jesus said, that's where the, I said, I'm not seeing where the problem is. He said, the problem is that my name is not in the list of your income. All the sources you said, offering, partners offering, you selling of gadgets and seed, people who sow seed or whatever, and then you will do all of this. My name is nowhere in the streams of income. I said, Lord, your name cannot be in the streams of income. In fact, my understanding of God providing for us was that he will send men to give us. So when people are giving offering, and like sometimes when we do the conference, our friends, some, we have some friends here in Nigeria, like, Mama will say, oh, Apostle, you're doing conference. I heard your conference is coming up. I'm sending my offering. Oh, I'm sending my support. 1,000 naira. No? <laughs> Whatever. I don't know how much 1,000 naira is. <laughs> $1,000. No? $1,000 is better. More than that. $10,000. Uh -huh. I'm sending my... my now, in, then my understanding was that if he's sending me $10,000 from Lagos, it is God that has provided. No? But you know what that understands? In fact, growing up in my, in my work with God, they taught me that God doesn't give money to people. Now when you ask for money, when you ask God for money, he will give you strength, he will give you wisdom, and he will open doors of opportunities. They taught you like, like me. That God doesn't give money. That if someday you open your drawer and you meet money, there is no, it's not God, it's mommy water. <laughs> now listen to me keenly. I'm, I, because I, when we go into the venture into that, it becomes dicey. But, so I told him, your name cannot be in the stream of my income. Because I was taught all my life that God does not give money to people. When God wants to give you money, he will use your brothers, he will use men around you to supply. Then he asked me, so who do you think put the money in the mouth of the fish that I sent Peter to go and, and catch in the sea? I say, yes, Lord, you are doing. Now, this is a discourse. We are standing, or it's not, I'm standing with him. He's talking to me, I'm talking back to him. In my first rapture, my conversation with the father was, you know, it was a non-verbal conversation. Now, let me just open the parenthesis. My, in my first rapture, I wasn't talking with my mouth. I wasn't talking to him like I'm talking to you. See, where I was lying under the tunnel, the father will speak to me. I will hear his voice. And while I am thinking my answers, I'm hearing my thoughts in the loudspeaker. See, your, your thoughts are audible in heaven. See, what you are thinking now in heaven, we are hearing, they are hearing it in the loudspeaker. 
See, when I went to heaven the first time, I understood why hating your... The Bible says if you hate your brother, you are a criminal. You are a murderer. Is that what the Bible says? You know why? If I hate you, in my heart, I'm wishing that you should die. No? I'm wishing that something should happen to you. Like I'm wishing that your marriage should fail. I'm, not, I'm saying it in my heart. Nobody here is hearing it. But in heaven, everybody has heard that. I want, you, I want to kill you. I want you dead. I want your marriage to fail. I want your business to fail. So in heaven, it's already done. In fact, they already know that I'll kill you. It's just that the opportunity hasn't showed up yet. You know? And that's why the Bible also says that God hears, answer us exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or imagine. Your imagination is a prayer. That's why you must be careful the thoughts you entertain. Because God hears not only the words of your mouth, he hears your thoughts. So sometimes you stand praying and you are saying one thing with your mouth, but your thoughts are saying the exact opposite and God is in between your two prayers. That's what James said, the man that is not, is an irresolute man or the double-minded person will not receive anything from God. Because you are saying one thing with your mouth, your mind is saying something else and God is saying, okay, the day you reconcile the two, I will know which one to choose. Are you here? Now, on my, this second visit, now I'm talking to Jesus like I'm talking to a human being. We are standing and I'm talking to him. So, I, I, when he asked me, so who do you think put the money in the mouth? You remember Jesus sent Peter to the river? He said, go to the river and the, throw the line. The first fish that you catch, open it in his mouth, there will be money in there. Take it and come pay for it, for you and for me. So he asked me, so who do you think put the money in the mouth of that fish that I sent Peter to catch? I said, hey, Lord, you are doing well. You have done well to have used that same example. Because that is the same scripture my fathers in the faith used to teach us that God doesn't give money to people. Because before being an apostle, Peter was first a fisherman. So sending him to the river to go and fish was sending him back to his office, his former office to go and hustle. And Jesus said to me, no, I didn't send Peter to go and hustle. Read the scripture where he didn't ask Peter to take the net and go and cast the net and then he will catch 200 fishes and then when he will pick them out somehow in searching the mouth of the different uh, many fishes that he will have he will find a coin or something. He said throw the line and the first fish. It was a commanded fish. The fish was positioned waiting for Peter to come. And when Jesus sent Peter to the river, he didn't say, go to the north side of the river or the west side of the river. Just go to the river. Throw the line, the first fish, whatever. Whether you stand on the east or on the west, the first fish that you will catch, there will be money in his mouth. Now, if it's you and me, you catch a fish and you find diamond in the mouth of the fish. With the mami water theory we have, you will know is a, is a queen of the coast that is pursuing you. So Peter went to the river and did exactly what Jesus said. When he pulled out the, 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 the line, one fish, opened the mouth, the money was there. And Peter didn't ask the question about where, who put the money there. He just knew. Jesus said, so he surely is the one that has done this. No. He got the money, came and paid the taxes for himself and for Jesus and they were released. Are you with me? Then he asked me, do you really believe that in the gospel I multiplied bread and fish for people to eat? Not once, not twice. Many times Jesus multiplied bread, fed the multitude onto baskets. Where I say yes. Say so you believe, you surely believe. I say yes. Do you also believe that Elijah in the house of the widow of Zarephath, that oil and flour were multiplying in the cruise and in the barrel every day as long as the famine, famine lasted? I said, yes. Oh, so you believe that a bird brought bread and meat to Elijah when he was by the brook Kerry? I said, yes, I believe. So he said, so if I can give, I can do that, what can I not do for you? 
See, we have put a limitation on God. What? Now, see, I'm not talking about miracle money. What I'm teaching now is not miracle money. It's not like lift up your phone, I'm going to pray, and money will enter. It's, that's magic. I'm talking about God's supernatural act in showing you that He's working with you. So He said, the pastors that are that cannot pay their children's school fees, that cannot pay their rent, that are struggling. They are limited not by me. It's not me. It's their theology, their philosophy about my way of providing for them that is hindering them. He said to me, Nyango, today I still have angels that are on the earth in charge of providing for my work. He says, those angels don't come to you and they don't come to your colleagues because number one, your theology prevents you from believing. First, you don't even know they exist. And secondly, your theology prevents you from receiving from them. He said, if you open your heart, if you believe what I'm telling you, they will start coming to you. I said, Lord, I, please now. <laughs> Hallelujah. See, Peter was on, Peter took a fast, Acts chapter 10. They fasted the first day, fasted the second day, and they fasted the third day. No? On the third day, the Bible says he went up to the roof to pray. He was concluding his fast so he can come and eat. They were roasting some nice fish for him. And while he was praying, he got into a trance and saw the heavens open. And the Bible says a, 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 a mat came down from heaven with all kinds of unclean animals. And he heard a voice, God's voice. I saw, now, yes, I, in, in it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the earth. Yes, go on. And a voice came to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time, what God has cleansed, you must not call Come on. This was done three times and the object was taken up into heaven again. See, that day for three times Peter said no to Jesus. No, Lord, I have never eaten anything unclean. God told him, don't call common or don't call unclean what God has sanctified. The vision came back the second time. He still said no. And the third time, that was it. See, listen to me, brothers and sisters. You never say no to the Lord. If Peter just said, no, I have never eaten anything unclean, we could give him benefit of doubt on the premise that maybe he didn't recognize the voice. But he recognized the voice. No, it's not so, Lord. When it is the Lord's voice, you don't resist. When the Lord speaks, the next thing to do is to obey. But see, Peter said no to the Lord three times. And you know what happened that day? That was the end of the journey for Peter. Remember Matthew, is it Matthew 16? You are Peter and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. No? Are you here? Whatever you open will be open and whatever you shut will be shut. He was the, is the one to whom the keys of the kingdom of heaven was given to. But this day when he said no to the Lord three times, you know what happened to him? Peter was demoted from being the chief of the church. After Acts chapter 10, Peter would disappear in the church history. A new chief will emerge. Who is that one? Paul. See, all these things you see Paul doing. I mean, in fact, Paul is now like the new commander of the church. Because someone said, 
not so long. How many times have we said no to God? That God spoke and we know that this is the voice of the Lord. And so, see, the portfolio that, he, that was given to Peter in Matthew 16 was divided into four pieces. Three, quarter, um, three quarters of it was taken away and given to somebody else. See, Paul will say later on, he that made Peter the apostle to the Jews made me the apostle to the Gentiles because I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Who was disobedient to the heavenly vision? It's Peter. It's Peter who disobeyed the heavenly vision. Now, before now, the gospel was only, you know, restricted to the Jews. And by Acts chapter 10, because of Cornelius' intercession and petition to God, God was now ready to take the gospel to the next to the nations. And he, 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 you know, God beat. Can I, is that the word? You understand a beep? You know, when some here you say flash, right? God flashed Peter. You know, now let me say something about God's direction. God doesn't always lead us with a, an audible voice. You will not always hear, my son, our friend, rise up now and go to Abuja and go and meet the president and tell him. No, you will not always hear that. God has multiple ways in which he speaks to us, in which he directs us. And one of those ways is that God will be flashing. Some of you, for the past, for some time now, God's been pressing in your heart to take our time and fast. No? That pressing, that, that intuition or that dealing your heart, feeling in your heart, is God's voice. When Peter took up the fast, the three days fast, God, an angel didn't appear to him and say, take three days to fast because God wants to take you to your ministry to the next level. But you know that these three days fast, God was preparing Peter because his ministry was about to go to the next level. And for for, for some of us, God has been dealing with you. He's beeping you. He's pushing you. He's giving you signs. Take a retreat. It's time to withdraw. You know? And you are, most of the time you hear it and you wave. You say, no, now my business is not very stable. Let me stabilize the business before I take the retreat. But you are not in charge of the calendar. It is God who is in charge of the calendar. If he's asking you to do it now, do it now. If you postpone it to tomorrow, you don't know what's going to happen between now and tomorrow. Hallelujah. Now see, if I were God's counselor, unfortunately I will never be. If I were, I were God's counselor, I would have told God that for, if you want to effect a major change like moving the gospel from the Jews to taking it to the Gentiles, you really need, you cannot just talk to Peter in a vision, in a simple vision like Rise up, kill, and eat. No, you will send Gabriel and Michael. You make it a very sensational appearance. So that Peter himself knows this one now is a very serious moment. No. God spoke to him. In a, I mean, if you, are, if you are fasting, you are fasted for three days, you have not eaten anything for three days. It is normal that if you are praying, maybe in a small sleep, you will see a vision of food, right? It looks so ordinary. But this was not an ordinary vision. It was God's setup to move the... I mean, God was about to change his modus operandi on the earth. He was completely revisiting or revising his operational mode on the earth. He's taking, moving the gospel from what has been known to be the limits of the move of God. He's taking it to the Gentiles. And this Peter is a perfect Jew. You really need to prepare him seriously. But God will not do that. Because God trusts that his sensitivity has reached the level where if God says it, he should be able to pick it. Hallelujah. And many of us say we have missed God. God has been speaking to you or pushing you to take a time of fasting. Take a time of retreat. And you have postponed it I don't know how many times. And in so doing, we miss the we miss the, the, the move of God for our lives. We miss the new thing God wants to do with us. So God said to Peter, since you are comfortable staying with the Jews, I will leave you with the Jews. Stay. Be the apostles to the Jews. I'm going to get someone else. 
who is going to be the apostle to the Gentiles. And that's how Peter came. So, see, all the work you see Peter doing was on the portfolio of, I mean, Paul. It was on the portfolio of Peter. He was supposed to be the champion of all this. But God found someone else that was ready to obey. Found a madman that was ready to say, I can go anywhere. Whatever the Lord says to do, I will do. And I have no problem. That's how Paul comes into the scene. And he, he takes over. In fact, at the end, Paul will say, I have worked more than them all. No? When you see the amount of revelation that was given to Paul. See, in the whole Bible, Peter has only two books. First Peter, five chapters. Second Peter, three chapters. Three. No? First and second Peter, right? First Peter is five chapters and second Peter is three chapters. You see, the revelation is dwindling. When Paul is writing and his letters are unending. Normally, it's Peter that would have written more. He was there. He was, he was an eyewitness. He walked with the Messiah, slept with him, ate with him. He's the one that the keys were given to. He should have done more than all of them. But, you know, Paul came from behind. And over. May the Lord make you so alert that you will know that this is the voice of God. Whenever you miss God's direction for your life, there's always a, a consequence attached to it. And if as I'm talking now, you, you, can, you, can, you can see, you can look back and see that in some occasions, you miss God's direction or God's voice. Repent and ask God for mercy. Yes, Father. Upgrade our sensitivity. Awaken my spiritual sensitivity, oh Lord. That in whatever be the, the, the means you use or whatever method you use to instruct me, that may, not, may I not miss your voice. May I not miss your direction. Thank you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So Jesus told me, I still have angels that are on the earth in charge of sponsoring my work. But they do not come to you and they do not come to your colleagues. Because first, you don't, even ex you don't even know that they exist. And number two, your theology about money prevents them from coming to you. See, God will not do something before he has. You see, uh, revelation will always precede manifestation. He will reveal it to you before he can do it with you. If you don't know it, he will not do it. Because he doesn't want to lose you. You know, that day I asked God, so when you, were, you had to pay the taxes with Peter, why didn't you just make money appear in his pocket? You know what he said to me? He said, I could make money appear in his pocket. But I didn't because Peter was religious like you. He said, if I had made money appear in Peter's pocket, that is the day I would have lost him. That's why he had to put up the scenario of go to the river, you know, using the familiar grounds to taking him. He's teaching him a new way of God, God's operation by using the familiar ground. And even with, you know, he says, to see how religious he was in Acts chapter 10, when God didn't use the pathway that he knew. That was it. So he said, I could make money appear in his pocket. Because God can do anything. Hallelujah. So now I'm saying, okay. He says, if I multiply bread, I can multiply anything. And what I'm saying, now like I said yesterday, this teaching is first directed to the pastors. The God who called you is able to pay your bills. And he doesn't need any man to help him do that. And if he wants to use a man, he's free to use anybody. But he can, do, he can do it without using a man. He did it using a bird. Now let me ask you a question. If you were in your room praying for money to do whatever, I don't know, you want money to build or you want money to travel or you want money to, for business, and then a bird enter your room with a check. Huh? You take it. Listen, before, before you started hearing this message I'm preaching now, have you ever seen a raven? Do you have ravens in, in Lagos? Now, what is, the color, what, what is the color of a raven? It's a black bird with a white collar, right? Now, you are praying. See, you are in your room praying. 
Lord, I need money. I need two million naira to start my business. And then you hear a noise. A black bird entering your room with, with pa, 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 and stands on your TV. With, see, if your house is in Ikeja where, where we stay, you just take two steps, you'll be here in church. In the name of Jesus, one, two, three steps, you'll be here. You come to the, you go straight to the pastor's office. Daddy, I have been telling you that the devil is pursuing me. <laughs> Can you imagine a wish bird in my room with a pile of money or with a check? Where is this money coming from? This bird is taking money from where to come and give me. No? Or you go to the market and buy a fish. No, let's be honest. You go to the market, you bought just one fish because you didn't have money. No? And you take the fish home and you open the stomach of the fish to remove all the excretors. And when you open it, you find $2,000 nicely passed over. Hey, ma'am, what would you do? Would you touch that money? Mami Wata, don't follow me for my house. But do you know that Elijah is sitting there by the brook? This bird brought fish. I mean, meat and bread to him morning and evening every day and Elijah never asked him where he got the bread from. Every day at the same hour this bird came with the bread. Fresh bread and fresh meat. Now ravens are known to be the most stingy birds on the earth. They don't even feed their own children. And you know that ravens feed from dead bodies, right? So if a raven brings you meat. That meat is coming from where? Surely from a graveyard or wherever. But this raven is a special one. He brought bread and meat to Elijah every day that Elijah was by the brook. And Elijah ate the bread and ate the meat without asking questions. Huh? To make it better. The day God told Elijah, leave the brook now and go. Go to Zarephath. That bird did not come. Does it ring a bell? You see, angels, eh? they wear human bodies, they wear animal bodies, it can be bird bodies, even fish bodies. Angels wear different faces and different bodies. This bird that brought fish to Elijah is not an animal. It's an angel of the Lord. And Elijah knew this is the angel of the Lord that is bringing bread and meat. That's why he never questioned him. You know that Elisha walked with bears, hungry bears, in Jericho, the, the bears ate 42 children. You remember? These bears that were working with Elijah were not animals. They were angels. This fish that brought money, I mean, that brought money to Peter is not a fish. It's not an animal. It's an angelic body that was commissioned. That fish was in the sea waiting for Peter. When Peter appeared, the, end, the fish positioned itself. When he sent the line, the fish took it, gave him the money, and went back. See, I'm, I'm sharing this with you today because God wants you to serve him in total rest. I didn't hear your amen. amen. God, wants to enter, God wants you to enter his Sabbath. That you are serving God and you are not calculating where the money is going to come from because the, the one that commissioned you has made provision for how the bills will be paid. There's nothing that he asks you to do for which the provision is not available. In fact, before he asks you to do it, the provision has been made available. You know where our problem is? We are too earthly. We are too human. We use our brain to do the work of God. We calculate like human beings. We look around the church, say, that woman there with the glasses, that pack that big car, who is she? That's why in the church, 
in the, in the canal church, we bring the rich in front. No? We make a special seat for the rich. We give consideration to people that are affluent, that have a position. Because of our calculation, it's our human calculation. No. Uh, in some churches, if you, the moment you enter, if you are well to do, the position you give you elder, deaconship, so that you don't leave the church, right? So we block you. Yeah. It's our carnal nature. But see, when I went to heaven, he told me, Nyango, to do the assignment that I gave you, you don't need no man. You don't need no man. The day you will ever need a man, you would have stopped needing me. Can I say that again? He said to me, Nyango, you don't need any man. The day you will ever need a man, you would have stopped needing me. It's me you need. That's why I said I said to pastors everywhere in the world, the work of God does not need money. The work of God needs God. When God is there, what, when we need money, he will make money appear. He will manifest the money. He can make it appear through, hey, listen to me. I have experienced angels paying my bills. So. That's a friend. Angels paid my bills. Go to the bank and pay. I'll give you testimonies if you want. You want a testimony? <laughs> I'll give you testimony. Plenty of them. Hallelujah. The day you will ever need a man, you would have stopped needing me. It's me you need. As you are walking, keep your eyes on me and not on anything. Look to me. Our eyes fix on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Our eyes fix on Jesus, not on the World Bank, not on the sponsor. Mama, see, before I went to heaven, my wife and I used to have a problem. You know, sometimes we would talk with our, some of our friends, our colleagues, the pastors, and they would tell us about how God has raised a sponsor for them here, how they, there's somebody there when they have a project. You know, these are the people that are helping them in the ministry. We never had any. I mean, like, at the time we were even frustrated, like, why is God doing this with us? I mean, like, we too want to have somebody, you know, that you know if you are planning a crusade, that you just write to him and say, see, we are having this crusade, and then he will send his. We never had, until I went to heaven, he said, I did it deliberately that you never had such. Because I wanted to teach you to depend on me and only on me. And see, today I thank God that we never had a sponsor and we will never have one. Everywhere I go to, I preach what God asked me to preach. I don't preach looking at your face. See, I'm, in fact, I'm not preaching for an honorarium. I don't even believe in honorarium. I tell, I tell pastors when I do conference with them, I say, what do you call honorarium? It's not really, that word is not in the Bible. Is honorarium in your Bible? No. I don't preach for honorarium. I preach to make Jesus happy. See, if you serve the Lord, he is the debtor to no man. You can preach in Lagos and the people of Lagos don't give you anything. And then God will wake somebody up in China and make him send you 10 million naira that they didn't give you in Lagos. You know that? Yes. So you are not, you are not preaching and counting how much offering are they going to give me. No. My pay is not from you. You didn't call me. See, I didn't come here because you called me. Or I came here because Jesus sent me. It's, you are the one that invited me, no? But it's Jesus that made you to invite me. He's the one that put in your heart. Did you know me before? You didn't know me before. It's Jesus that put in your heart to invite me because he wanted me to come here and serve him. So I didn't come for you. I came for him. You understand it? Yes, I came for him. He used you to invite me to Lagos. It is, he's the one I am representing here and he's the one I am serving here. When I'm done serving him, 
my, my bill or my salary comes from him. Whatever you give me or whatever the church here gives me, I will receive with thanksgiving. Whether it's one naira or a million naira or ten million, whatever I receive. Thank you. You know, but that's not my salary. Oh, see, after Naomi, my, the church I pastor, I tell them, you didn't call. Were you there when God called me? After Naomi wasn't there. So don't think I'm, I'm not working for you. I'm working for him. My eyes are not on you. My eyes are on him. And he pays well. He pays better. Oh, I say he pays better. If the church gives me any offering, I don't despise you. See, our church is now 15 years. Huh? Oh, 16 years this year. This year, 16 years. For the first 10 years, we were not receiving no salary. In fact, we were removed, we were the one giving. They, she will tell you, sometimes my children were frustrated because I would take all the money. I would go around preaching the world. The money that I get, I use it to, we wanted to advance the work of God so much. Because we are not doing this thing to get, I was trained to give to God. Whatever I get from my, I give it, I put it back in the work of God. The little he permits me to eat is okay. If I eat and cover myself, that's it. The reason I'm alive is to serve him. And then one day the Lord said, you are not doing good service to these people. It's not a pay, it's not a salary. But at the end of the month, they must, even if it's one collar, they must, you, you need to receive from them so that the Lord Paul said, when I started the ministry, no church partner with me in giving and receiving. You need that connection with the church. See, when we started receiving assistance from our church, at the end of the month, hey, I say, pay the bill. We have churches that are planted around from the central church. They say, send assistance to all my pastors. Whatever, if something is left, if 1,000 is left, give it to me. I take it and put petrol in my car so that the blessing that I represent will flow. If I don't receive anything from you, I'm depriving you. Paul said, the only sin I committed against you is that I preached the gospel to you for free and I repent of it. You know, he repented that he would give him, like he would tell me, daddy, we need like 250,000 to buy this, that, this, and this. I'll give him 250,000 that he will spend 245 or 240 and keep 10,000 because the pocket must never be left empty. So he will, he will use 240,000 and buy the things that he needs to buy and he will keep 10,000 in the envelope, the construction envelope. And then maybe they ask him for something that like well, they need 5,000 to buy something. Then he will go back to the envelope to take this. Take 5,000 from the 10 he left. He'll go and find 250,000. True. I'm not talking about in the days of John the Baptist. I'm talking about now. You want to have the experience? How many of you want to have the experience? See. God is my witness today. You will see it. Yeah. See, it's not magic. It's not me. It's God. See, everywhere I've taught this, eh, that we'll finish and we'll do offering. In the evening, people will come here and tell you, I only had 10,000 naira, and when we did the offering, I put the 10,000 naira in the offering basket. But when I went home, I opened my bag, I found my 10,000 naira in my bag. See, angels send money, you receive an alert. This amount of money has been positioned in your account. I, see, when you know, you know this is the angel of the Lord that has done this. In 2006, before I went to heaven, 2006, I went to Singapore. I was attending Haggai Institute. Anybody here has been to Haggai? Haggai Institute? No? Oh. Okay. Now, Haggai Institute is a, is, is, is a, is a leadership training. You know, they train third world leaders. Are taken to, they either go to Singapore or they go to Maui. In Hawaii, in the Hawaii Island, and then you spend a month training. I mean, top class leadership training. In my in my batch, we have a lot of Nigerians. 
in those days, uh, when I had to go for Haggai, you know, I had to give a contribution. Like, they pay for everything. They pay for your ticket. They pay for... It's a, it's a high selection. When they select you, they cover all of this thing. But you have to give a contribution. In our days, the contribution was $500. So I waited for the last minute to send my own 500 the day I got the $500, I went to the, in those days, telephones were not very common. I went to the telephone booth to call the office and ask them for the, the name through which I had to do the Western Union and send the money. So when I called the Aga Institute office in Singapore, I said, good morning, sir. My name is Pastor so -so, -and -so from Cameroon, and I'm, I want to send my $500 for the for my contribution, for my training. The man who received me on the other side, on the other side of the line was Mr. John. He said, good morning, Pastor. Uh, are you Pastor Pierre from Cameroon? Matricule number, so, so, and so. I said, I said, yes. He said, but you have already sent us the money two weeks ago. I said, no, sir, I didn't send you no money. He said, yes, you sent us the money. I said, no, it's not me. He said yes. I said no. He said yes. <laughs> then he hung up the phone. I left the telephone booth and I ran home. Told my wife, come and see, come and see me trouble. I called this man and this is what he said. She said, no, I'm sure you didn't, you did, maybe you didn't say it well. Let's go together. You know my wife. <clears throat> we went back together. I called the man. Hey, good morning, sir. This is Pastor Pierre from Cameroon. He said, are you not the one that just called me? I said, yes, but I said, please listen to me. You are talking about $500 sent two weeks ago. It's not me. Please verify your account. I didn't send you money. He said, I've told you that you have sent us the money already two weeks ago. And that's all I need to tell you. If it is not you, it is your angel. He hung up. I'm looking at my wife, she's looking at me. I said, did you hear what she said? She said, so my wife said, very prudent that you, this woman is. He said, no, let us not take a chance. When you go, they had already sent me my air ticket and everything, so I was ready to go. So when you go, take their money with you so that when you get there, if they say it was a mistake, <laughs> so that they don't go and embarrass you there. So I took their $500 in my pocket. When we got to Singapore, we went to the, to the Haggai Institute office. When we got there, I just, my first question was, where is the finance department? They said, the office there. I entered the office. Guess who was on duty that day? <laughs> Mr. John. So when I entered the office, I said, good morning, Mr. John. He said, are you Pastor Pierre from Cameroon? I said, yes. And I said, Mr. John, now you are seeing me face to face. Let me, <laughs> let me tell you the truth. This thing that you were saying on the phone, he said, wait. He went and pulled out his, his record, the register. He said, is this not your name? I said, yes. Is this not your no matricle number? I said, yes. See, this, what, is, what date is this? It was exactly two weeks the day I was calling. He said, this is the date. You, this same voice called me and sent us the $500. This is it here. And then he looked at me and said, I have never seen a man of small faith like you. What an unbelief. See, me so, I'm known to be a champion of faith. <laughs> he said, then he told me, the man that called me to send the money was this man, the same voice. And I don't know how I master the voice is you and then I told him Mr. John between you and me in this office it's not me he said, then he said if it is not you it is your angel yes you can clap we were going to the Bible school in those days we were going to the university and doing Bible, attending Bible school at the same time Towards the end of the year, we had to pay for graduation and the first year, right? We had to pay for our graduation and for all, and we didn't have the money. 
So they said, by this date, if you have not paid, they're going to send you out of school. That day we came to school, we were sitting, waiting. Now they were reading the names of the people that didn't pay so they can go out of the class. They read all the names and they didn't read the two of the, our two names. And then I'm looking at her, she's looking at me like, did you pay? What happened? At break, we went to the finance people and said, you called the names of the people. We didn't hear our names, but the truth is we haven't paid yet. And the direct, our director said, an angel paid for you. Not only for this year, even for next year. Everything has been paid until you finish your school. Up until today, I don't know. Do you know? We don't, we don't know. Up until today, we don't know who paid for us. Paid for everything first year and second year. This God I'm preaching to you. See, you don't have to look to the left and to the right. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Now, see, we went to Ashland. Did I tell you that the day he changed our program, we had $1,000? He said, remove all the money and put it in the offering basket. We obeyed. You have to obey God. Tell your neighbor, please obey God. Mama, everything that God is asking from you, if God, if you ever have the privilege of God asking something from you, it's because he wants to give you something that is a million times bigger than what. He doesn't take from you. He is looking for, he's trying to enlarge the vessel so he can pour in. We obeyed and I thank God we obeyed. Remove the $1,000. And you know that time, $1,000, not be small money. Even today, $1,000 not small money. We naturally, we just obeyed our little children. I told my wife, he said we should give, she said, my husband, I'm following you. Remove the money, we held our hands, prayed, and we put it in the offering basket and left. That same day, listen to this, when the day we arrived in Ashland, we were going to Ashland, we didn't know where Ashland was, we didn't even know anybody there. When we arrived in Ashland, we found out that there's a brother there with whom we were at the university. When we saw him there, we said, oh, this brother, we lost touch with him. We didn't even know where he was. So he is here. When we saw him, we were excited. At least we have found someone from our country that we know. We tried to go to him to, you know, like, he was so cold with us, like, keeping us. So we just decided, okay, if he doesn't want to deal with us, let's leave him. That day when we put the $1,000 in the basket, we went back to our room. We had a knock on the door. When I opened the door, it is this brother who was, didn't want to, in fact, we were greeting him, he was greeting us from afar, from afar. It is this brother now in front of my door. He's trembling like this. I said, brother, what? See, we came here, since we came here, we're trying to connect with you and you are keeping us at bay. What is the problem? He said, no, I have seen a lot of crooked people come here. You know, when I see all these people from Cameroon and, uh, you know, like they've come here, they've caused so much havoc that me, I don't, I don't want to identify with. So when I saw you people come, I decided to, to go to God in prayer and ask God, that, who are these people? Are they, are they, I didn't want to see you with the eyes of the days when we were still in the university. Huh? I didn't want to see you with the eyes of, I, I, I was asking God to reveal to me who you really are. So last night, the Lord appeared to me and told me that you are indeed his servants. Mama, this man who wasn't greeting us came and removed his bank card in America. He said, this is my card and this is my code. I'm giving it to you, whatever you want. Have you been to America and somebody give you his card? He said, whatever you want. This brother gave us his card. He said, the Lord told me you are his true servants. And he said, I should be. Number one, I will put myself at your disposal. I will be here to serve you. I will be your driver. I will, please, if you do your laundry or you iron your shirt or you polish your shoe, you would have sinned against my covenant with God. I am here at your disposal. If you have shoes to polish, 
chest to iron, dress to wash, whatever, please give it to me. This is my card. Whatever you need, it's at your disposal. We've been to many places and people have given us their card. It's not natural. Is it? It's not natural. One day we went to the U.S. And, and, and one of my mentors, he gave me his bank card. He said, take my daughter to town and go and spoil her. Whatever you see that you like, you buy. It is called a blank check. You know, I was so humble when I bought her, I bought her smartphone. I bought her... When we came back, my bishop, I mean, he was angry. He said, I gave you a blank check, my son. You didn't say Royce Royce to buy. <laughs> I gave you a blank check. You should have bought a high car. See, God does that. But see, we stayed, I told, did I tell you here that the Lord said, you are preaching for nobody, you are not going out of here, don't call anybody, stay here until the last, until I say go. Now, we went to Ashland to stay one week. We went to Ashland early June. He kept us there June, July, and August. The whole period of vacation, our children were with their grand, grandparents, and when we hit August, now all the you know African parents now school is soon coming. School in Cameroon starts in September here too. Now you know when August comes, all the parents are restless. You haven't finished buying the school fees of your children, paying the school fees and all of that. Here we are. We are in Ashland. We are stuck. I mean, God, we are hijacked. God, we are in prison. How are we going to do with the school of our children? And God is not allowing us to go preach anywhere. We're just going to stay, be staying here like this. Mama, for the, eight, for the three months that we stayed in Ashland, he sent strange people. I remember after this brother gave us his card. A few days later, one of our daughters, I don't know how she heard that we were, we were in the camp. She traveled from, the, from one city, one state, near, to, near uh, Virginia, and came to, uh, to the camp. She said, Daddy, I heard that you guys are here. And the Lord said, I should just come and greet you and give you some money so that you can buy fruits and put in your fridge. And she gave me an envelope. When we opened the envelope, $1,000. Money to buy fruits. We wanted to rejoice over the $1,000. The Lord says, no, your money. Put it in the offering basket. We received like this eight different people that gave us each one, $1,000. Every time we receive the money, we say, oh, at least now we, we can even send it back home for the school so that they can start buying things for school of our children. The moment the money will enter our hands, the Lord said, offering basket, offering basket. Until one week to our departure. Remember, we don't know, he didn't tell us you are going to leave this day. Now, I know one week because, you know, like the week before he, he gave us the freedom to go home one morning we finished the morning prayer we are walking out of the temple this brother who gave me his card he came to me he said do you have a son called Shiloh I said yes Shiloh is my second born he said because last night I was praying he didn't know my children we are not discussed about our children he said last night I was praying and the Lord showed me a boy. Shiloh. He described, he said, he's this high. I said, yes. He said, Shiloh is in which class? I told him. He said, the Lord said to me last night that everything that concerns Shiloh's school for next year, I should cover the bill. So do you have any, what, what are his needs? Just calculate whatever he needs for a year. His uniforms, books, exercise books, even the transport fare and the money that you give him for snacks, everything, calculate how much is it in a year and tell me. You know what my wife did when we were going to Ashland? The day before, the, the, the day before we left, she told me to her children, she gathered her children and was talking to them. She said, every one of you should sit down and write whatever you want daddy and mommy to bring for you from America. 
I look at my wife, I say, you, you like trouble. <laughs> These Android children, you ask them to write anything they want. And you know what? All of them, starting from this one sitting here, they sat down and wrote all the, they want iPhone number this, they want iPad number that, they want PlayStation and Xbox 360, wrote all kinds of crazy things that young boys and young girls can write. So when this brother said, do you have any needs of Shiloh? I just told mommy. And the mommy told them, write, each one should write in two copies. You keep one copy in Cameroon and give me one copy. I'll go with your copy. And then she said, as I'm gone like this, stay back and pray. If you pray well, I will bring what you wrote. So when this brother now told me, he said, is, is there any, can you summarize the list? I told mommy, where's that list that Shiloh gave you? She gave me the list. I brought the list to him. I said, these are the things that Shiloh wrote. And the things that he wrote had nothing to do with school. So he's, the, and the brother said, I will buy this one, but I want you to calculate how much does the school cost. And so I sat down, I calculated everything. So he said, tomorrow at break time, we will go to town. We drove to town. Two suitcases full of all the fantasies that Shiloh asked for. We bought all his things and filled his two suitcases. Then everything that he needed for school, he said, convert that, tell me how much is that in US dollars. I told him, we went to the bank, he pulled out the money, he gave me, he said, this is for Shiloh. Mama, counting until the snacks, he said, every day, how much does his snacks cost, how much, Count, calculate it for one year, give me the money. Two days after that, after the, we are walking out of the, 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 the prayer session in the morning, one white lady, old, old elderly woman, I mean, small white lady, she followed me to the door and said, Pastor, Pastor, can I talk to you? I said, yes. She asked me, do you have daughters? I said, yes. Do you have two daughters? I said, yes. She said, well, as we were praying this morning, the Lord was speaking to me about your two daughters. And the Lord said, I should cover all the needs of your daughters. I told mommy, please. <laughs> bring me the list for Lagrand and for Shinone. I brought the list. Gave her, I said, these are the things that my daughters. She said, which school do they go to? I said, I told her. She said, calculate everything that has to do with their school. Calculated everything. And she said, I don't have the strength to go with you to the, to the to town. Just tell me how much is that in US dollars and I will give you the equivalent in cash and then you will do. We calculated, gave it to her. She counted the money and gave me. This is me. I haven't preached for anybody. Yeah, it's not honorarium like, oh, because I sweated, I preach. I'm pious, mama. I never received money like that from the all the time I've been preaching. Thousands of dollars. In my, in my room. Like, my wife and I will go to our room and throw the dollar on the bed like this now. <laughs> it's good to follow God. Now, you see, you see, the good thing is, it's not a dollar we are worshipping all. Oh, see, my heart is not attached to the dollar at all. Like, what I'm seeing here is I'm seeing God. I'm seeing the supernatural hand of God. So, Lagrand, Shiloh, and Shinone, the first three are now settled. I'm left with the last two born, Yobel and Bishop. The eve of our departure, my daughter that I called when we were, when we, were, we had to go to Ashland, the one that made the ar arrangement, she called me, she said, because when the Lord released us, he told her two days before, he said, now, your, your stay here is over, you can go. That day I called my daughter and I told her, the Lord has released us, maybe tomorrow or next tomorrow, we're going to go home. And then she said, Daddy, but school is resuming in Cameroon tomorrow. Now that you are living here now, how is it going to happen with the children? I said, the Lord is taking care. And then I said, well, the Lord has already covered the school fees for La Grande, for, Shinone, for, for Shiloh and for Shinone. And the money that we have here is enough to cover. She said, how about your bell and bishop? I said, 
the money that we have here is enough to cover for all of them. She said, no. That, and this girl, this is my daughter, they are twin girls. They said, the two, the two of us, we're going to cover for Bishop and Yobel. Tell us what they need for their school. We will send you the money. We left America loaded. Um, we had how many suitcases of things? That, about, we had about 10 or 12 suitcases. We couldn't even carry all. The two of us could not, we couldn't travel more than, we carry, we, I think we came home with eight. We left the rest in the U.S. Pockets filled with dollars. I came back to Cameroon for the first time. I paid my children's school fee like a big man. I went to, to their school. We came back. The school started that year on the 7th of September. We arrived on the 8th. On the 9th of September, I drove them to school. I went to the boss. I said, calculate everything, everything, like everything, and tell me how much it is. <coughs> when she finished calculating, I said, you want me to pay you in dollars or in safe <laughs> See, I am giving this testimony to the glory of God. From that year, we entered complete rest as concerns my children. See, as I'm talking to you now, after that year, one, the year after, we are preparing for school, and then this brother comes to my house. He's not a member of our church. He's somebody that we know in the body of Christ, you know, just the fellowship of... He does, he's not, then he wasn't very close to us. He travels to the U.S., comes back. No, he's in the U.S. He's in the U.S. and he calls me. I saw his number. I said, oh, he doesn't usually call me. I picked the call. He said, Apostle, good, good morning, good morning or good evening, whatever. I said, yes. Well, we greeted and then he said, please, I want to ask you a question. Do you have a child that is called Shinone? I'm, I mean, from the time I sat in the plane, from Cameroon flying to the U.S., I kept hearing in my spirit, Shinone, Shannon, Shinon, Shannon. It's like a name I've heard in your house. Do you have a child like that? I say, yes, Shinone, Shinone, Shinone is my second daughter. He said, the Lord was speak, speaking to me in the plane that that child is my child. And as long as she wants to go to school, anywhere she wants to go to school in the world, until she is done with school, it is my bill. I'm talking about 2016. 2016, right? Yes, 2016. It is my bill. As long as she wants to go to school, as far as she wants to go, it's my bill. I said, if the Lord said, who am I to say no? He came back. That year. He said, so which school does she go to? They were going to a normal school, you know. He said, no, that's not the kind of school the Lord showed me. Remove, we remove, I removed my children from that school and took them to an American school, international school, where the school fees is about 3.5 to 4 million every year for one child. Long story short, eh? as I'm talking to you now, all my children, the five, I'm not paying one from 2016 till today. I don't pay a cobo for on any of them for their school. Like when I mean school, I'm talking about tuition, books. In the international school they go to every year, they do field trip, they do what exchange calls, they go to different countries, visas. Tickets on where they go to is not. They calculate everything and everything is covered. On my father, is that no? Is not. Are you? All angels are not always flying wings. And these are not people that you say, okay, I discuss with them. You see, things are hard. No, they are not doing that because they're sorry me. In fact, they they told me the day you spend a cobo on them, you have sinned against our covenant with God. So, I don't have any pressure. If you have children who go to school and their school fees paid for, I, I mean, you are not breaking your head on anything in school. Are you not, can you not concentrate and pray eight hours a day? The Lord has taken away your burden. You can pray. 
Talking about the building, see, we are, we are erecting a building. The building that we are finishing, by the grace of God, when it be finished and furnished, it's going to be 500 million safer. Our economy is not as booming as the Nigerian economy. And the church in Cameroon doesn't give money like that. You know, Cameroon pastors, want, I mean, they, we know that the, Niger the Nigerian church is a giving church. Francophone church, countries don't give like you people do here. Let's see, we are building that church in Cameroon, in a country where, and we are not doing fundraising. We are not sending support letters of support, uh, please, we are right, building, please help us. No. Papa, we started building that temple September 2020, in the midst of COVID. In the midst of COVID, when people were hiding and just wanting to be alive, God said, start building. 500 million project. How much money did we have in the church coffers? 3.5 million. See, last night, I will show you the video when we finish. Last, last night, when we left here. No, last year, October, I went to, to Canada. I was preaching in Canada. You watched my conference in Canada. I finished preaching the conference in Canada. And then on Monday, a gentleman asked to see me. I didn't know him. Never seen him. Doesn't know him. Like people who want to see the man of God, he came to see me. He said, I attended the conference. And the Lord spoke to me. He said, the temple you are building, anything that has to do with audiovisual equipment, sound system, musical instrument, cameras, computers, I mean, anything that you... Name anything you need for this for the sanctuary. It is my meal. He said, I heard you say the Lord says when we wanted to start the project, my leader said, Daddy, please, Bible says when you, so that we don't start and five million. This project is five hundred million. Where will the money come from? I told him, see, the money you see on this building is not. Offering, offering time, blessing time, please give your best. The Lord will bless you. Mm -mm. You are not giving here for God to bless you. You are giving because you love God. It's your pleasure to make God happy. And you are not forced. See, in our church, when we do offering, I tell them, you are not forced to give. In this church, nobody is compared to give offering. If you don't love God, God doesn't love your money either. Did we read the scripture yesterday, Acts chapter 8? He said, it is wickedness. He said, repent of thy wickedness. If you, are, you haven't given your heart to God, and if you do not love the Lord, he doesn't want your money. Keep your money. Are you with me? Hallelujah. See, in Ashland, during worship, precious stones drop from heaven. We experience the same in Cameroon. It's not magic. Oh, where are the books? I wrote a book, Gateways to the Miraculous, Experiencing the Supernatural. Precious stones, mama, during worship, like this drop. Diamond, gold. In Ashland, one sister was worshipping and she felt something drop on her neck. Big like this. It was a big diamond. Sold for $200,000. We, we experienced the same in Cameroon. In our church. See, during worship, gold dust will pour on people. People will leave the service covered with gold. Let me, I stop going that direction with the church because many people were coming, you know, and then they said, well, why is God giving us dust? He should give us, no, you know, because they are greedy, their heart is not circumcised. See, get ways to the miraculous experience in the supernatural. It's real. It's, see, it's not, the only supernatural we know is the magic, the African magic, the Nollywood Supernatural. 
That's not what we're talking about. That one is counterfeit. The real is with God. If you know the true God, the living God, you can manifest clean and true power. Now, if people that enter magic can have a snake that vomits money for them to use, we see that in Africa magic, right? People enter magic and then Satan will give them a snake. That snake every Monday morning at 8 o'clock will vomit 50 million naira and you must spend it before Friday at midday. And then they do that and then some, one day they die of mysterious death. We believe that Satan does that. But no, we don't believe that the God of the heaven can do even better. Oh, I will tell you some more things this evening if you are here. Are you here? Yes, sir. See, mama, if Satan can do that, eh, God can do it a million times. Copying God is what he's doing is a counterfeit. It's a counterfeit to the original. The original is in God. And I will explain that to you this evening. You hear me? Please. Now, some of you think we are when we're selling these books, we, we are making marketing. It's not marketing. Oh. Love yourself enough and buy all these books and read them. Did you hear me? Buy them and do what? Don't just buy them. If you buy them, you haven't. If you buy them and don't read, you haven't done anything. Buy them. More importantly, you read them. I'm t See, this book, Holy Communion, Death Antidote. Uh, we went to Congo, Congo Brazzaville. And once Catholic sister came to the conference and she bought these five. This no, there was no five then, it was three. The first three. This these first three books. She bought the three books and left. She came for the morning session for the, the session with the pastors and she wanted to come back in the evening for the general session. And that evening in the convent, the senior sister, is that how we call her, did not give her permission to leave. Huh? The senior nun. Uh -huh. They refused her permission. So she was frustrated. She went back to her room and started reading this book. She was halfway into this book when the Lord Jesus walked in her, into her room. In the convent, Catholic sister. Jesus walked into her room at around 10 p.m. And she discussed with him from 10 p.m. to 1 a.m. At 1 a.m. That day when she, when she bought my book, she came and assigned the book. She asked me for my number. I gave her the number. At 1 a.m., my phone rang. When I checked the phone, it was this Catholic sister that is calling me at 1 a.m. I told my wife, is this, are we safe? This Catholic sister is calling 1 a.m. I didn't first, he ran until he went to voice. Me. I didn't pick. Then she called again. Then I picked the call. And I said, sister, are you, is everything all right? She said, he just left. He just left. She was shouting, he just left. I said, who just left? She said, the Lord Jesus. She said, I was at the page. She gave me the page. She said, I was reading this page when suddenly he appeared in my room. And he discussed with me for three hours. Jesus, not in a vision. Hallelujah. The supernatural is real. The author of it is our God. Can we pray? Let's pray. So I cherish the whole rugged cross till my trophies I will clean and exchange it
baptized us naturally on. And that night we were praying, walking to the room, walking around. And in the middle of the prayer, an angel appeared. And he said, Now God, I came to take you. And he took off the garment I had and put a new coat on me, white coat. Put me some medals here and put my epaulet. And he said, Let's go. This is my fourth visit to heaven. He took me around Cameroon, showed me some things that I will not discuss here because it doesn't concern, concern you. He showed me some places in Cameroon. He said, you see these strongholds, these are the strongholds that I want you to destroy because these are the things that are keeping the nation under bondage. Well, he finished showing me them in the different parts of the nation. Then he said, I want to show you a last thing. Listen to this carefully. He took me to heaven. He said, let me show you this last thing before I let you go. treasury room of heaven. We entered this. He took me straight. There was no gate. We just went straight into the treasury. Treasury house. Like the central bank of heaven. It was a massive building. I mean like huge structure. Filled with money. All the currencies that you can imagine on the earth. From Naira to Sefa to dollars to euros to pounds to everything. Pile up. See, there was sections per section. The Naira section, the Sefa, euros, dollars. And then we walked in the corridors. I walked with the angel. Took me around. When we finished visiting, he brought me back to the place where we started. And see, the Naira section, I mean, the, the section were divided into two. This section here, clean notes that have never been used. And on this side, notes that have already been used like old notes, dirty. He said, do you understand why these ones are clean and these ones are dirty? I said, I think I understand. He said, well, how do you, what do you understand? It means these ones are circulated. They have used this one. He said, yes. He said to me, you, some of your fellow ministers and brothers and sisters on the earth have access to this place. They withdraw from here to advance God's cause on the earth. I brought you here so you see it. So that's why you see these notes are used. These ones are still clean because they've never been used. So he said, I want you to climb on this. There were bales of money piled like this, like containers. You know these containers, like to spy one. He said, I want you to climb on it. I climb on it. He said, I want you to dance on the bale. And I did. He said, dance very well. I, I dance on the clean money. Oh my, my God. When I feel that, he said, come down. I came down. I said, climb on this one too. I climbed and I danced on it. And then we went, we went around the second time and they said, let's go. I said, no, we cannot go like this. I said, we can't go like this. He said, why? I said, I cannot enter here and see this thing and then we just go. I said, give me even one day. Let me take home. He said, no. Not now. I said, why not now? He said to me, do you know how much money is in one bill like this? I said, maybe a billion. He said, what do you mean a billion? It's more than a billion. I said, just give me one. He said, no, not now. I said, why? He said, I want you to go and teach this reality to the body of Christ when you don't yet have that kind of money. Because if I give it to you now, suddenly you will appear with a lot of money and when you will teach them, they will not believe you. They will think you have dabbled into something and you are trying to cover up. But he says, in the days ahead, I'm going to give you the access code. Then I said, okay. I left. We came back. I told my wife. I told her the experience I had. I saw it. Oh, Papa, the money is there. That's why I'm telling you, whatever dream the Lord put in your heart for him, the money is, is, is there. It's waiting for you. For... We came back and then we organized a conference in the west of Cameroon, a city called Bafusam. We got to Bafusam. 
And then as we started the conference, we started here. I taught the first day, and then the second day. Second day, I finished doing this teaching that I'm doing now. And then at break time, we were supposed to go and eat lunch in one of our daughter's house. We entered her parlor, sat there. There was a book on the table. How many of you know a man of God who is now a blessed memory called Professor Zachariah Stane from who? Nobody. You know? You read his books. Anybody has read his books, you have heard of his. Just one person. Ah, Zachariah Stane from is well known. No. Zachariah Stane from was a holiness. I mean, if you talk about someone that preached holiness, he was one of those. You know his books, right? Huh? He was a university professor. He was a dawn professor, dawn, university dawn. But radical preacher, like radical. In fact, Zafomu can give you a list of 450 sins that you must confess. So we found he, one, of, one of the books that they published after his death. This book was published from the notes that he had in his journal. So, me, I had never read any of the books of Professor Zag when he was alive because he was not my kind of preacher. First, his way of being radical was just too much for me. So, we found this book on the table. The title of the book is From His Lips. And while they were serving the food, we were going through the, the pages of the book. And I got interested in book. We got interested by the book. So, I told my daughter, can you lend us this book so we can read it? And she said, oh, daddy, I can even give it to you. If you need, I will even buy your copy and bring. She gave us the book and we went back to the hotel. That same day, we finished reading the book. And guess what, mama? I discovered in that book, Professor Zach Fomum had taken a retreat to Israel. Spent 21 days retreat in Israel. He was begging God to make a covenant with God so that he will give 100% of his incomes to God. At that time, he was already giving 75% of his income to God. And he went to Israel to beg God that God should accept that he will give him 100%. And God refused. God said, if you give me 100% of your income, and when I'm talking about his income, I'm not talking about his salary. He was giving to God his salary. Everywhere he went to preach, any offering they gave, it, gave to him, he gave it back to God. Zaphon had published so many books. I don't even know how many hundreds of books he had written. His books are sold up till now, sold all over the world in the billions. That money, all of the money of the books, he returned it into the gospel. He told God, I want to give you 100% of my income. And God asked him, when you give me 100%, you will live of what? He said, I will give you everything I have, so I will live on what you will give me. At the end of his 21 days, God accepted. He made a covenant with God and came back to Cameroon. He, the testimony says, when he came back, he was in his prayer closet praying. And an angel appeared and deposited money on a pillow by his bed. 20 clean notes of 10,000 safer. When he saw the money, he got scared. He ran out of his room. He went to church, called for his elders. The elders came and he told them, this is what I saw. This is what the I showed them the money. He said, this money I'm showing you. Clean notes of 10,000 and the numbers were following each other. He said, this is the money that the angel, the elders didn't believe him. The elders thought, because he was a champion in fasting, he used to make super long fasting. They thought maybe something is now shaking in here. He was so disappointed that the elders did not believe him. When he was going home, God told him, when you came to make covenant with me, in Israel where the elders there how do you expect them to understand this so the Lord told him go back to your room and create a place prepare for me a coffer and God said whenever you will need money my angel will come and deposit money in there 
It is reported that until Zach Fumum died, the angel of the Lord was coming to put money in that coffer every day. When he died, they found hundreds of millions in that coffer. He was using that money to travel. But all the money that he worked for, everything that they gave him, even if you gave him a shed as a gift, he will return it to ministry. He will give it to God. He had a coffer where the angel of the Lord was putting money. When I saw it, we, I mean, my wife, we scream in the hotel. I said, so I'm not the only madman that, you know, because some things God tell you and then you are imagining the brothers, you say, when I tell them, how would they, they will not think, that, I, will they not think that something is going off in my head? If Zafomu could experience this, then it's true. We went to Libreville. We were preaching in the church like this. When we finished the conference, we finished the conference on Sunday. Monday morning, we were flying back to Cameroon. The pastor of the church said, Apostle, the Lord laid in my heart to give you my tithe. Normally, my, my tithe, I send it to my, 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 my spiritual father. But the Lord has instructed me that the tithe I have in my, in my coffer, I should give it to you. He says, I want to beg you the permission to receive my tithe. I said, if it is the Lord that asks you to do it, obey him. Then he said, the money is not plenty. It's just 250000 I said, it's not a humble. How much? No. It's the obedience to the voice. He said, the money is an account. I have, I have, I have created an account in the bank. And that's why I keep my tithe. And when it reaches a certain amount, I will, say, I will push it to whoever. So, the money there is 250000 I'm going to take it. I will come and give it to you before we go to the airport. I said, yes. He went to the bank. When he got to the bank, he put his card. As for the, the balance, how much was the balance, Mama? Huh? No, the balance was 1,250,000. 1, 1, he said, no. The balance in this account is 250,000. Because it was 500. It was, it was 550 and the week we arrived he withdrew 300 to give to somebody he was left 250 and he was still the amount was still clear in his mind he, he went back to the car and told his driver the amount that I know that is in my account is 250 how come I'm seeing one point something the, the, the driver said no go inside and ask your account manager how much money is your so he went inside the paper that the, the balance that the machine gave him, he kept it. He went inside and told the, the, the account manager, please, can you consult this account for me and tell me how much is the balance? The lady took the paper and wrote the amount. Same amount. He was so scared. When he came out, he, he finally withdrew one million and came. When he came out of the bank, he called me. He was almost crying on the phone. He said, Apostle, this thing that you are saying is true. I said, what? He says, do you know that I went to, the, to my account? God knows that I, I know that the money in that account is 250000 I found one250 I said, see how you are trembling that an angel put one million, added one million to your money. What if you found 40 million? And he came and gave me the one million. He says, this one million like this, I don't know. I don't know. I said, are you here? See, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray for you. If you are here, I want to start with the pastors. See, the last time you, you went to borrow money or you went to ask for money was the last time. If God wants to do it through men, he will use men as he wills. But if he doesn't want to use men, he can use wise men. He can use angels. He can use anything. See, he can put money himself. You will take your suit that you wore yesterday and you didn't leave no money inside. And you go back now and take it in your room. And you find $2,000 in the pocket. That way you know that it is not you that put the money and you didn't. It's not Because in the bank you may think that maybe somebody made a mistake and sent money in your account. 
If you go back now and you use the trouser that you used yesterday night and you know that there was no money inside, if you put your hand there and you find $2,000, clean notes, you will believe, you will know this is the hand of God. I have a son of mine, a pastor. Every week, the angel of the Lord sends him money on his telephone. You have mobile money here. Huh? Airtel money. Huh? Mobile. Every week, he receives money on his, on his phone. And it is a, he knows that it is the angel. And the money that comes into his phone is exactly the amount he needs for the week. Now, when we are saying this, we are not saying you should do work anymore. We didn't say, stay home and fold your hands and wait for God. To... No. This is not you. It's, see, it's not something that you trigger. It is God. God's doing. Hallelujah. And it is mostly for his servants. So that you are not preaching one distorted gospel because you want the congregation to be happy so they can give offering. No, you will stand in the truth. Because you know your support doesn't come from them. Whether they yes, I'm not coming. Whether they give you the offering or not, you are still going to say what God wants to you want you to say. You are not afraid uh, if the rich man gets angry, he will leave the church. It, see, in our church, I tell them there's nobody here that should not leave. Anybody can. The only person that must never leave is my wife. Even La Grand can leave. The day she gets married, if she marries somebody from Nigeria, she will go. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes, Mama, come. Yes, I wanted to say, when the Lord started telling us all those things, we understood why we had to deal with idols. If you are greedy, this is not for you. If you are dead to money, if you are not impressed by numbers, if you have the work of God at heart, then this can be open to you. Because the Lord does not want us to be slaves to money. All what he's giving to us is for us to use for him. Not to be slaves. Many a times we take time to insist on the first visit. Because if you've not understood or if you've not established Jesus as Lord over your life, you will not understand this. You will think it is fake something. You will think it is uh, another money doubling. Amen. So it's important. Your heart has to be right. Right heart, right attitude, right mindset towards God. That's why he's saying we are not looking at the faces. We are looking up to him. He is the one that is leading people or things towards us. Amen. Hallelujah. See, the last thing Jesus told me when I went on this trip, he said to me, Nyangok, there is a Jesus way of doing ministry. There is what? You know what the Jesus way is? There is never a time you saw Jesus put an offering basket and ask people to come and give. Did you notice that in the New Testament you will not see any place where Jesus collected an offering? You are not sure. Instead, when he had his largest congregation, or his largest meeting, he is the one that gave them an offering. He fed them. He didn't take from them, he gave to them.
You know what, what is the Jesus way of doing ministry? Doing ministry looking up. Doing ministry how? Looking up, looking to Jesus. The author and the finisher. See, in Jesus' ministry, there were some women that were traveling with him. In Luke chapter 8, you will find that. No? But they are there because God brought them. But Jesus will not, does not depend on them for anything. He depends on his father. And if he's going to use people, thank God. But they are not the sponsors of his ministry. See, Jesus has been preaching to this multitude now for three days. For three days, they haven't gone home. And on the third day, Jesus said to the disciples, he called Philip. And he said, Philip, where can we buy bread to feed this multitude? The question is where? The question is not how much money do we have? No? And when Jesus asked Philip the question where, he wanted to know what, where is the closest bake, what is the closest bakery around here? where we can buy bread. And the Bible added that when he asked him the question, Jesus himself knew what he was going to do. He was asking the question because he wanted to test Philip. And when he asked the question, Philip ran to Judas and asked him, so, hey, how much is money is in the, the, the coffers? Judas told him how much money was there and he quickly did the math and came back to Jesus and said, the money that we have in the account if we have to buy bread for these people, it will not be enough. So send them home so they can go and fend for themselves. And Jesus said, no, they've been here three days. If we send them home, they will fend on the way. We need to give it them to eat. He said, make them sit down. Now, the Bible said Jesus knew what he was going to do. The Bible did not tell us what Jesus was going to do. Right? Now, Andrew overheard Jesus' discussion with Philip. Andrew was not in the discussion. When Andrew had Jesus asking Philip about bread, Andrew went to the crowd. Hey, is there anybody here with bread? I heard the master looking for bread. And he found a little boy that had his breakfast, five loaves and two fishes. He collected the, the bread and came to Jesus with He said, Lord, I heard you talking about bread. I found five loaves and two fish. I don't know what you wanted to do with it. And Jesus said, well, since you have brought it, then we're going to use it. But remember, the Bible said Jesus knew what he was going to do. We don't know what Jesus was going to do up to until now, right? So he took the bread that Philip, that Andrew brought, sat the people down. He took the bread with his 12 disciples, gave thanks to the Father, broke it. Jesus was not the one that distributed the bread. Though. He broke the bread and gave a piece to Peter, to James, to John, to Andrew, to Philip, to Bartholomew, to Thomas, to Nathaniel, to, no, to Jude, Jude, and asked them to go and share. Now this is what happened. The bread multiplied in the hands of the apostles as they were sharing it. He will come and give to this one, he will break, and the bread will grow. He will break, and the bread will grow back. He will break. The peace that Jesus gave them kept multiplying as he gave them. When they were eating the bread, they would bite the bread and the bread would grow. And they would bite. When they finished eating, everybody had his hand full of with the same bread that this little piece that was given to him had multiplied in the hands of both those who were sharing and those who were eating. When everybody had eaten the fish and the bread, the Bible says, how many baskets were collected? Now, these people have been in wilderness for three days listening to Jesus. Who brought the 12 baskets in which they put the loaves? Huh? Where, the, where did the baskets come from? Now we know that Jesus had something in mind. Now this place is a wilderness home. So it's not like Nigeria here we have grass everywhere that people can easily weep and do 12 baskets in which they gathered all the leftovers and filled the 12 baskets. It tells you 
Some angels were already positioned. It's Andrew that spoiled the plan. Are you with me? Hello? Hello? See, I want to pray for you. Some of you, God is my witness. Some of you here, you are indebted. And you don't even know how to pay your debt. The Lord will supernaturally pay. Even at the bank, the, your bank is going to send you an alert. Thank you, Mrs. So so and so or Mr. So so and so for clearing your debt with us. But I want to start with the pastors. If you are a pastor in this auditorium, please come forward. After this conference, Money is, Mama, listen to me. God is my witness. Money is going to be the least of your prayer request. That your amen didn't sound like what I said. Amen. The Lord God liveth before whom I stand. He is going to make money the least of your concerns. Amen. When you kneel before God, you will have better things to pray about. I'm praying for money because he will, show, he will prove to you beyond doubt that the money you need for the work he has given you is available. See, God is going to send strange people to you. He's going to speak to people that you, I mean, to strange human beings. He's going to send you angels so they will enter your office like this, give you, and when a man of God was planning his building project. And one day, he had a knock on the door. In fact, let me give you two testimonies, then we'll pray. He had a knock on the door, and a man entered his office. A man dressed like us entered his office. He said, good morning, pastor. He said, good morning. He said, you don't know me, but I was sent to give you this. He put a thick envelope like this in front of him. He said, I was sent to give you this. He says, the one who sent me said, it is for the project that you are planning. He took the envelope. He turned to put the envelope behind him. Like, you know, you're sitting in your office and you want to put, he took the envelope, he wanted to put it away. He turned, the man had gone. He left his office, ran around. Asked everybody, did you see somebody like this? Nobody. The man was gone. He came back and he knew he was an angel real it's not see i'm not telling you it's, one of my sons one day he left his house in Douala. he had two thousand safe in his pocket he wanted to go and put air, air time in his phone so he can call somebody because they just called him that his children had issues in school and he didn't have to go and pay some money in the school for the children so he got to the lady that put that puts the credit he gave the lady 2,000. Somebody tapped him from behind. He turned. A man in dress in white, like white boo-boo like this, behind him said, I was sent to give you this envelope. He turned and took the envelope from the man. And when he, and the lady said, Sir, which number should I send the credit to? When he turned to give her the number, he turned, the man was gone. He asked the lady, did you see the man that was talking to me here? The woman said, which man? He said, the man who gave me this envelope. He opened the envelope, the exact amount he needed to go and pay for his student's school fees was in the envelope. One man in a white, like an Ausa man wearing white, had stood behind him, gave him an envelope with money inside. Just the time to, he, the man tapped him and said, I was sent to give you this money. He collected the money from the envelope from the man, wanted to ask him, who are you? What is your name? The lady who was giving, putting her time said, sir, which number should I send the credit to? He turned to give her the number, by the time he, the man was gone, disappeared. Hallelujah. My father, here are your servants. You sent me here for them. There are issues, there are challenges I may not know. But because I'm one fellow of workers like them, I know what are the battles and the issues that pastors face with money with respect to ministry. 
especially when we labor among people that don't have the understanding of giving generous, generously to God Lord as I pray for your servants today you send me as a witness and I pray that these ones will be the testimony that the message I brought was not an imagination from my mind Lord I, I pray I plead with you on my knees confirm this message I have preached today in the lives of your servants in the name of Jesus whatever be the project that you will carry in your heart for God for the kingdom of God for which money has been a hindrance money has been a blockage today as I give you the right hand of fellowship may the heavens open over you may the angels that supply for God's work on the earth locate your life and locate your ministry in the name of Jesus I pray that you will experience supernatural supply in the name of Jesus yes father I pray that you will dispatch angels and men and wise men that will bring gold and silver and frankincense and mirth to your servants in the name of Jesus I pray for you that from today you will do ministry the Jesus way you will experience rest you will experience God's Sabbath in your ministry concerning money you will enter God's Sabbath in the name of Jesus father honor the prayer I am praying today and honor this handshake that I'm giving to your servants in the blessed name of Jesus and I pray that if any of you here oh you owe the bank or you owe individuals that the God of heaven that before whom I am kneeling now will move supernaturally on your behalf clear off your bill and make you a free person in the name of Jesus I pray that you will experience financial freedom in ministry in the name of Jesus Amen Amen please don't go I want to shake your hand but listen to me God is my witness he's going to bring money to you I want to tell you what Jesus told me he said promise me that when I make you rich you're not going to live a flamboyant lifestyle. See, the trademark of a true servant of God is sub this soberness, huh? modesty, sobriety, being sober in all things. See, you may even have 50 billion nairas in your house. You must not wear a 20 million watch so that you are proving you are not proving nothing if, I, if you want to prove how rich you are prove it in the works that you do for god as i'm talking to you today someday when you come to come please come home. come and see it's not that they are saying we are building churches i mean everywhere almost on all our mission field we are buying land and building we want to build beautiful for god that's how we want to show how rich we are. Not that I'm driving a very expensive car and I have 14 private jets in my yard. I don't even know what to do. No. It's not us. It's not on us. It's on him. The goal he's given us is on. we dress it on him. A little portion of it, yes, for our pocket. So we eat some. No. Yes. A portion of it for me to eat. To live a decent life. Live in a decent. See, I don't have to live in a very sumptuous and luxurious house. To, I'm not proving anything. But the house of God that I'm building, I want you to be luxurious. Not for my image. It is Jesus' image I'm trying to correct. You know why I'm building that expensive church? Because in my country, church is just, I mean, pastors just manage any building that everybody has abandoned. You know, we know they know that all these Pentecostals they worship God in one so we decided to build something that will speak it is the image of God we are trying to portray not us it's not about me it has nothing to do with me or with anybody hallelujah so please God will do it I'm, I have no doubt as I shake your hand God will make you enter that realm. but please 
Let it not be like the other people we, the Babylonian pastors and apostles and prophets that we know out there, the brothers of Balaam and the sisters of Jezebel. No. Live sober. Live a decent and sober life. Everything about him, boast of him. Because the only boasting that is allowed in the Bible is that we know him. Right? But of ourselves, nothing to boast about. In Jesus' name. So, can I? Yes, so be it. 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 Baba, open the heavens over me. So be it. Open so heaven. You don't know me, but last night the Lord spoke to me and said, I should send you two Mercedes Benz and one Jeep. That is supernatural supply. Supernatural supply is that you go to your account, you know that the money that was in your account was 10,000 naira, and then you receive an alert and you go to the bank and you find 12 million naira in your account. That is supernatural supply. So I pray that you will start experiencing supernatural supply. May it start even now. In the name of Jesus. I pray that the Lord will give you a sign. See, as I am praying now, the angels of the Lord will release gold dust in this place. Some of you, you will look at your hand or your face and you are glittering with gold. When you see it, you know that it is a sign of God's visitation. In the name of Jesus, I speak the heavens open over your life. I speak the heavens open over your family. I speak the heavens open over your ministry. I speak the heavens open over the church. I speak the heavens open over your enterprises. In the name of Jesus, if any of you under the sound of my voice, whether online or on site, is indebted to individuals or to bank or whatever, may the angel of the Lord supernaturally clear off your debt. In the name of Jesus, may you experience financial freedom. May you experience financial freedom. In the name of Jesus. 
as I shake your hand, the Lord bless the works of your hands. May the Lord bring increase to your life. May the Lord bring increase to your works of your hands. In the name of Jesus, may it be well with you. May it be well with you, spirit, soul, and body. In Jesus' name. And see, as I shake your hand, if you are sick, you're going to be here. If you are under a, a curse, that curse is going to be broken. See, now, when I pray for people, I don't, I'm not, I don't want you to fall so that it feels like I have power. The power is not when you fall before me. The power is when you come back with a testimony of a changed life, a changed condition, a changed situation. That's where the power manifests. You understand what I'm saying? So I, 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 when I'm shaking your hand, I don't want, if you fall, that's okay. But I, I don't expect you to fall. Or I'm not, I don't want you to fall so that it feels like there was power. Hallelujah. I am a child of God and therefore I am not a slave to sin, death, fear and faith. The power of God flows through me. The grace of God works in me. The power of God helps me daily. As I go out, I walk in victory and I am established in Christ as an oak of righteousness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.